I grew up in an environment where traditions and religious ceremonies are to be practiced to show our dedication and faith to God. I served in the church at a young age. I assisted the priest during church services and actively participated in other church activities. Back then, I never doubted my beliefs and happily accepted what I was told. However, despite my religiosity, I fell into pornography, alcohol, and other vices. Although I was still attending church regularly, I was living a double life. This got even worse when I had to leave my hometown, Nasugu, and move to Manila to study college. I was exposed to even more vices and immorality. One night, a friend shared that she was invited to attend a service in a Christian church. She told me how different the experience was. The message taught biblical principles and other, and that she learned that many of our religious practices were inconsistent with, the, with what the Bible says. I got offended, and the lawyer in me kicked in, and we debated about religion that night. I argued that those people were just manipulating her so they can convert her and join the religion. After having that discussion, I was bothered with how little my knowledge of the Bible was. I would hear it being re read in the church, and yet I didn't know much about what it says. That led me to look for classes where I can learn more about the Bible. My search led me to CCF's Welcome Wednesdays. At first, I was hesitant because I knew I was entering enemy's territory. But I was determined to learn, so I decided to attend. I told myself, I will just be there for the sake of learning what the Bible teaches, and if someone tries to convert me, I will refuse and walk away. Surprisingly, for the first night session, I had a pleasant experience. The Bible was taught in class, and then we would discuss it in our groups. I like it that uh, we get to ask questions freely and share our ideas so we can dig deeper into the lessons. I can still remember how my D group leader back then prayed for me that evening. He mentioned a biblical promise in his prayer saying, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Indeed, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Week after week, I would return to CCF to attend the sessions. I didn't realize it that time, but I was slowly starting to fall in love with the Jesus of the Bible. I was amazed that the gospel was so simple and straightforward. I learned from our study of the Bible that a person is saved by grace of God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. That it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It was at this point that I clearly understood the gospel and decided to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. By God's grace, I began to let go of my sins one by one. I became eager in sharing the gospel to my friends, office mates, clients, even to people I meet in courts and parking lots and taxi drivers. I formed D-groups in CCF Center, in our office, and among my friends. The hardest to share the gospel with, however, is my family. They vehemently opposed my decision, but I didn't lose hope. I wanted to invite them to CCF, but since my parents live in Nasug, Batangas, it would be difficult to bring them to Manila. So I just continued praying to the Lord. One day, I was in Nasugbu. I stumbled upon a poster invitation to a Bible study organized by D-Group group from, from CCF. I was excited and immediately joined them. I learned that the members of the group were mostly from Cavite and other parts of Batangas and are starting a Bible study so they can bring CCF to Nasugbu. I knew this was God's answers, answer to my prayer. I realized how little my faith was. God did not allow me to bring my family to CCF here in Manila 
because all along it was his plan to bring CCF to Nasugbu. Praise God. My humble prayer was for God to bring salvation to my family, but his bigger plan is to bring salvation to even more people in Batangas. Praise God. Eventually, I took over in leading the group. For three years until now, I would travel from Manila to Nasugbu weekly to meet our D group and, and have our Bible studies. There were challenges, but by God's grace, from an average number of less than 10 attendees in 2016, now more than 100 people from Nasugbu and nearby towns from Batangas have attended GLC1 classes and CCF Nasugbu Saturday worship services. From one D group last year, we are now training at least 10 potential D group leaders who will start to lead their own D group in various life stages before the end of 2019. And by the grace of God, our D group in Nasugbu is now one of the upcoming CCF satellites in South Luzon. As for my family, my mom gave her life to Christ and is now also connected to a D group. Praise God. I thank the Lord Jesus Christ who strengthened me. It is only by His grace I am what I am now. I am Peds Lima Felix, servant of Christ. To God be all the glory. Praise God. Praise God, Attorney Peds. Now, last week, we talked about being ready. Be ready for the second coming. What will help you sustain being ready? Today, I want to share with you about the importance of the grace of God. What is the meaning of the grace of God? Because Acts chapter 22 is the personal story of Paul. He talks about how God touched his life. Do you realize some of you may have loved ones that seem impossible to come to Jesus. You, you feel like this person is hope, hopeless. Perhaps your husband, your wife, your family members, your parents, in your mind, they are hopeless. Well, today, you'll discover something. The grace of God, how it can transform us. Some of you are struggling with pornography, with vices. In your mind, you are hopeless. I have good news for you. Understand the grace of God. What is the grace of God? Well, the grace of God, based on my research, has the following definition. Everybody read together. Grace is the unmerited favor. You don't deserve this. Of God. That saves us. The grace of God brings salvation. Not just salvation. It gives us the desire internally the desire to do God's will and the power to do His will. So the grace of God not only brings salvation, it does something to your heart. It changes you from the inside out. And then it gives you the power to do His will. How will I show that to you? We will look at the Bible. We will look at the Scriptures. We will look at the testimony of Paul and you will see all of this happening in his life, in the life of attorney Peds, you can see what happened to him. He was transformed. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 1, together, the grace of God has appeared. Notice, the grace of God has appeared. What does it do? It brings salvation. But many people stop. Don't stop upon salvation. Continue reading. It instructs, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. It does something to your heart. It changes you. Change your desire. Not only that. And to live sensibly. It gives you the power to live out what you believe. To live out sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Do you see the big picture? The grace of God brings salvation. It changes your desire. Sanctification helps you to live out a holy life and then it guides you to serving Him. 
Why do I say that? Don't stop in verse 12. What is verse 13? Verse 13, 14 tells us, everybody together, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Do you notice? Because of God's grace, you begin to set your heart on the second coming of Christ. It motivates you. You need motivation. Notice the title of Jesus. Jesus has the following titles. Our great, together, God and Savior. So the early church already believed Jesus is God and Savior. Continue reading. Who gave himself for us to redeem us. This is a beautiful word. To redeem you, to save you from every lawless deed. Now look at your life. You begin to see what you were like in the past, what you are now. Have you seen changes? Yes or no? Only five people were changed. <laughs> Do you see changes? Yes. Amen. And not just to redeem us, everybody read, to purify for himself. Grace is God choosing us for himself. Everybody read, a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Zealous for good deeds. So a real person who experiences the grace of God, you, you will see changes. There will be testimony. There will be stories. What you were before, B.C., before Christ. Turning point, how did you come to Christ? And A.C., after Christ. That is the story of the Apostle Paul. And that's why I gave you a form. Can you give out, can you get that form, please? It's about the one-minute testimony that's given to all of you. We want you to write it down. It's called a one-minute testimony testimony, what God has done for you. Example, before Christ, three adjectives. What were you like before Christ? How did you come to Christ? You write down, and after Christ. Now, if you don't have any testimony, you have no story to tell. Is it possible? You have not experienced the grace of God. If you have no story to tell, Perhaps what you have is religion. But if you have the grace of God, you will have this outline clearly. Before Christ, how did you meet Christ, turning point, and what happened to you after you met Jesus? I will be happy to share with you my one-minute testimony. Would you like to have a sample of it? Before I met Jesus, I grew up in an amazing family. My father was a very successful businessman. Yet in spite of all the money, you watch, you, you look at your watch, one minute. I had no peace, I had no joy, I was afraid of dying, I was empty. Then one day somebody came and talked to me about Jesus, how Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And that day, I surrendered my life to Jesus. And as I look back, I realize what has happened to me. I now experience peace, I have joy, and I have purpose. And I began to ask myself, if I did not meet Jesus, what would have happened to me? Would you like to know Jesus? One minute. Praise God. See, you need to write that down, you practice. And then I have another testimony, five minutes. I have another testimony, 10 minutes, no problem. I just shared with you one minute testimony. Now the Apostle Paul gave his testimony, believe it or not, three times in the book of Acts. Acts chapter nine. Before he came to Christ, how he came to Christ, what happened to him. Today, Acts chapter 22, his testimony. And then a few weeks from now, Acts chapter 26. Why is testimony so important? Let me tell you why. When you give a testimony, nobody can argue with you because you are not talking about religion. 
You are talking about what happened to your life. You are talking about what God did to you. It's powerful. So the Apostle Paul proclaimed the gospel by his testimony. He talks about the grace of God. Now, let me just share with you the grace of God, okay? Another verse which you are familiar with. Everybody together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What can you learn about grace? Grace, something you don't deserve, brings salvation. You have been saved through faith. Is it possible to know you are saved? Yes or no? Is it possible today that you can be sure if you die, you'll go to heaven? Yes or no? You know why most people are not sure? They don't understand grace. And many, many people today, they are sincere. They go to church, but they don't know whether they'll go to heaven or not. You know why? They have religion. They have not understood the grace of God, Jesus. The Bible is very clear. By grace, you have been saved. Notice, past tense. You can be sure. How? Through faith. Today, I want to explain to you grace. By knowing grace, I hope your faith will grow. Next, not none of yourselves. Even faith, even grace, you have to know it's a gift of God. Grace is something from God, not because of works that you will not boast. Now, many people stop here. Don't stop here. What is the next verse? What's the next verse? After nine, what's the next verse? Ten, smart. Now, what is verse 10? What? See, you need to read your Bible. Verse 10 tells us, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Grace should never stop on salvation. It continues on to good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. So, ladies and gentlemen, through grace, what will happen to you? Salvation, sanctification, you are changed. And then service, good works. So I'm challenging all of you who have experienced the grace of God, I want you to be rich in good works. I'd like you to volunteer in CCF. We need Sunday school teachers. We need teachers in public school. You know why? We have a program to teach the poor how to have a high school degree. We need teachers. We need people to visit hospitals. We need all kinds of volunteers. We need volunteer. If I were you, the first volunteer is get involved in a small group. That's how you serve God, in a small group. Be a leader, be a servant. Just join a small group. Say, I like to serve in a small group. If you are good in music, join the music team. Now, just because you join does not mean you will be allowed to sing, okay? I'm just telling you, but just join, and then we'll see what you can do, okay? Because they're very strict. They have this audition. That's why I'm afraid to, to audition. They may not accept my beautiful voice. But I'm telling you something. We need volunteers. Would you like to serve God, yes or no? All right. We have many ministries. But everything begins with small group. Somebody talked to me yesterday. Peter, can I start a motor biking, a motor biking club? Because I love motorcycling. I said, why not? Some of you are members of the off-road off roader club, the four-wheel drive club. No problem. I challenged somebody yesterday, put up a golf club. You love to play golf? Put up a golf club. In other words, serve God. Amen? All right. Let us now look at the Apostle Paul. He is called the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace. Do you know Paul wrote about grace almost over 110 times? Grace. You know why? He experienced grace. Let's read this together. I am the least of the apostles, and I am not fit to be called an apostle. Look at his humility. Because I persecuted the church of God. Paul says, 
I'm not even qualified to be an apostle. Why? I was against Christianity. But, everybody read, but by the grace of God, something I don't deserve, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. You know what Paul is saying? I am what I am today because of God's grace. Once upon a time, I was fighting Christians. I was fighting Jesus. And then something happened, the grace of God. I am what I am today. What is he doing? He's not proclaiming the gospel. He's serving Jesus. Why? The grace of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the grace of God has the following main points. I want you to know. Number one, it's undeserved. Say it with me. Undeserved. Number two, it is uncoerced. Nobody ever forced God to give you grace. It's freely from God. It's uncoerced. Nobody forced God. Nobody forced God to save the Apostle Paul. Nobody forced God to touch the Apostle Paul. God did it on his own. The next thing you need to know about grace is transformative. Say that with me. Transformative. It changes you. How will you tell if somebody is a fake Christian? Very simple. A fake Christian has religion, but no transformation. So you can tell whether you are fake or not. But God loves everybody. If you are a fake Christian, God says you can be a real Christian today if you understand grace. And lastly, grace must be received. You know what Paul said? You got to respond to grace. Paul said, by his grace toward me did not prove vain. In other words, the grace of God was not useless. He accepted it. He did something about it. But I labored even more than all of them. You see, grace and working for God has no conflict. You do not work to go to heaven. It's by grace. But because you are going to heaven, you now work hard. You see the difference? One is motivated by love. One is motivated by grace. The other is motivated by fear. No, no, no. Grace. So, I'd like you to learn something from the Apostle Paul. What's the title today? Everybody read. Experience God's grace. Can you turn to each other? Tell them, experience God's grace. Make sure you experience God's grace. Let me repeat. It has the following components. True grace. It's unmerited. Understand? It's uncoerced. Nobody will force God to extend grace. It is His own. He loves to give it to you. You can never force God to do anything. Grace is transformative. It will change you. And lastly, grace is to be received by faith. Are you ready? All right. Let's look at Acts chapter 22. The second time his life, he gave his testimony, recorded in the Bible. Together now, ready? Go. Brethren, fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. The best defense is your testimony. You must know what happened in Acts 21. You know what happened? They were going to kill him. Do you, do you remember? They were going to kill him. In Tagalog, binugbog siya. And he was saved by the commander of the Roman army. Without that, he would have been dead. But you know what he did? While he was being saved by the Roman army, excuse me, sir, excuse me, allow me to talk to all of these people who wanted to kill me. That's how much he loved the people. So he began. Look at how smart Paul was. Paul called them brethren, fathers, kuya. Kapatid, listen to me. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, not Greek, Hebrew dialect for connection, they became even more quiet. They got interested. You see, you need to connect your audience. Paul wanted to share the grace of God. 
So what did he do? He talked about his life using certain languages that they can understand. Look at what he said. You want to know, Paul, what he was like before Christ? This chapter has three simple outlines. Before Christ, how I came to Christ, what happened to him after Christ. So, Paul began. Paul said, I'm a Jew. Boss, pareho tayo. You are a Jew, I'm a Jew. Born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Hey, guys, I am cultured. I was not born in the province. I was born in Tarsus. Tarsus is a special city. Rome did not destroy Tarsus because it is a sophisticated city, a rich city, cultured. And Rome gave that city special power. You can be a Roman citizen if you are born in Tarsus. So special. And then he said, but brought up in this city, what city? Jerusalem. Paul is saying, hey, guys, I am not just cultured. I grew up in Jerusalem, the capital of Judaism. Hmm. Educated. Paul said, I am educated. Not just educated. I'm there, Gamaliel. Strictly according to the law of our fathers. Now, who is Gamaliel? You know what Paul is talking about? To connect with the people. He's telling them, I'm no stupid boy. I'm not just educated. I sat under the most famous rabbi, the most famous professor, Rabbi Gamaliel. His story tells us he is number one. He is respected. Gamaliel, many times, is called the light of the law. He would teach the Old Testament that people will understand. So Paul is saying, that guy is my professor. I sat under his feet. I am not stupid. I know the Bible. That's what he's saying. According to the law of our fathers, I know the scriptures. Being zealous for God, just as you all are. And Paul is saying, I am religious. I am zealous. Do you understand? What kind of life, what kind of man the apostle Paul was? Educated, cultured, and religious. And he continued, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prison. He's saying, hey guys, you hate Christianity, I hated Christianity also. I put these people to jail. I even wanted them killed. Now, everybody, listen to me. Why was Paul so against Christianity? Think about it. Why? Because of his past. He was Jewish, educated under Judaism. Judaism, the Old Testament, teaches only one God. And here was Jesus claiming to be the Son of God. Here was Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. Here was Jesus claiming to give eternal life. For the Apostle Paul, this guy is crazy. He's deceiving everybody. Can you imagine people worshiping Jesus? He hated Jesus. He said Jesus is a deceiver. You know why? Why will people worship Jesus? Only one God. Do you not understand the background? He was sincere. Sincerely wrong. Friends, some of you are sincere. You are religious. But you can be sincerely wrong. You see, the grace of God will overcome even your wrong thinking. Paul was sincerely wrong. In his mind, Jesus was a fake. He never believed Jesus died and rose again. You have to understand Jesus. The way he taught the disciples was unique. You know why? Listen. Jesus is the only person who will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father except through me. Excuse me? Yeah, bang, yeah, bang, mo. And then Jesus would say, I give you eternal life. 
and you will never perish. My Father, who gives you, who gives them to me, will protect them. I and the Father are one. Wow, what kind of claims? And then Jesus would prove it. He made the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He made the lame to walk. And he made the dead come back to life. And then he said, you crucify me. After I die, I come back to life. Do you think Paul believed any of this? Of course not. Paul said, these guys are all deceivers. Mga So that's his mission. What is his mission? Persecute this way, the Christians. What else will they do? Putting them to prison, men and women. In fact, Paul is saying, hey guys, the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. They know me. They know who I am. From them, I also receive, notice, letters, mission orders to the brethren and started off in Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. Such was the zealousness of Paul. By the way, if you want to prove Christianity, look at the life of Paul. What changed him? You see, if you look at the Bible, you will notice the way it is written. It is not a fairy tale. It is not a legend. You know why? Look at the way it is written. High priest, the council of elders, they can testify. In other words, everything you can verify. That's what's happening to our Bible. You can verify it even in the day it was written. And then what happened? It happened as I was on my way approaching Damascus. About noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven and all around me. Notice, in Acts chapter 9, he did not emphasize the bright light. He just talked about what happened to him. In Acts 22, he emphasized the bright light. Why? The audience were Jewish people. The audience knew that God oftentimes described himself with Shekinah glory, the glory of God so bright. And Paul is saying, the light was even brighter than the sun. And what happened to me? He's saying, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice. Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Grace, unmerited, uncoerced. Who asked God to intervene in the life of Paul? Who asked him? Who forced him? No one. You know, I look at my life. I hated Christians before. I don't like Christians. I was very religious when I was younger. But God did something. Divine intervention. In your life, in my life, in the life of attorney. You know why? Grace is something from God, all right? Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Do you realize sometimes you don't appreciate grace? Because grace comes in mysterious form. Something bad can be grace. The reason why I'm bringing this up, because I know some of you are having problems today. Physical problem, health problem, perhaps cancer. I know one of our pastors, the wife is diagnosed with cancer. My heart goes out to him. And you can be asking, why is God allowing this to happen? Some of you have problems. But God is calling your attention to wake you up. That's why you have problems. Because God knows how to get our attention. How did God get the attention of Paul? How did he get his attention? How? You know, God got the attention of Paul. A bright light. He fell to the ground. And then Paul said, who are you, Lord? The most important question, who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus the Nazarene, to make sure Paul know who is this Jesus of Nazareth, the one that he has been persecuting, whom you are persecuting. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are the Apostle Paul, 
and you ask, who are you, Lord? And the voice came, I am Jesus. Now tell me, how would you feel? Friends, when the grace of God is going to manifest in your life, you will notice something. You will be drawn to Jesus. And you begin to discover who is Jesus. You see, the issue is not, do you know the Lord? Do you have a Lord? All of us worship something. All of us serve something. Listen to me. Whether you like it or not, you have a master. You have a Lord. The only question is, who is your Lord? I know many people. Their Lord is money. Their Lord is sex. Their Lord is what? Themselves. You make decisions not based on what God wants. You make decisions on, based on what you want because you are the Lord of your life. And that, my friend, is the beginning of experiencing grace. When you begin to realize, excuse me, I am not the Lord. There is somebody who is bigger than me, and he is Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us the Apostle Paul was shocked. Those who were with me saw the light. To be sure. But they did not understand the voice. You see the eyewitnesses. There was light. There was voice. But they did not understand. You know why? The grace of God is oftentimes specifically designed for you. God knows how to get your attention. He asked the second most important question. What is the first one? Who are you? Second, what shall I do, Lord? The moment you ask Jesus, what shall I do, Lord? You are beginning to experience grace. Because you begin to realize he is your boss. What shall I do, Lord? And you know how the Lord answered him? The Lord said, get up, go on into Damascus. There you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. You see, God has a plan has a purpose for your life. Do you know that song? Que sera, sera? When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Que sera, sera. In the Christian life, no que sera, sera. You know why? Because God has a plan for you. Not whatever it will be, will be. You know, you ask young people today. Oh, bahala na. Que sera, sera. No, 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 no. God has a plan. The grace of God has a plan for your life. And when you experience His grace, you will know His plan. Many people think the plan of God it's for me to marry this person. After marrying this person, I will live in this place. No, no, no. Do you want to know the will of God? Would you like to know? Well, keep listening to the message. The Bible tells us. Paul said, since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. You notice something. God told Paul, I will tell you what to do. He did not tell him immediately. What happened to Paul? He was blinded. If you look at Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 26, he was blinded. He could not see. The light was brighter than the midday sun. Now listen to me. If you cannot see, if you are blinded, what enters your mind? One of the worst nightmares of any businessman of any person is to become blind. When you become blind, you become helpless. You will need people to guide you. I believe Paul, God allowed Paul to be blind. You know why? To show Paul. You need help. You know, most business people are very proud. Self-sufficient. I arrived last night. I came from Pearl Farm, Davao. I was invited to be a guest speaker in a CCF couples retreat, but very expensive. I didn't realize Pearl Farm is so expensive. 
So a lot of those participants are all bosses. Mga bossing lahat. But you know, I praise God. They were told, when you come to this retreat, please obey the rules. Humble yourself. And praise God. You know, slowly but surely. My point is this. For Paul to experience the grace of God, he has to be humbled. Because sometimes God wants to call your attention, but you don't listen. God knows how to make you listen. And many times, it's through trials. Can I tell you something about trials? Trials, problems, they are the invisible grace of God. Your trials, your problems are the invisible grace of God in action. You know, years ago, I was hospitalized. I was never hospitalized in the past. I was very strong. After getting married, I, I never was hospitalized. But when I was around 33, 34, 35 years old, I got hospitalized. Why? I did not know I had hepatitis. I, was, I must be eating clam, you know, clam, uh, shell food. That's why today, please, when you invite me for lunch, don't give me clams. Don't give me oyster. Don't give me anything with a shell, okay? Because I'm always thinking that's how I got hepatitis, okay? And my wife has to help me walk. My wife said, what's wrong with you? I was so tired. I, I could not walk. And then when I went to the toilet, my wife has to help me. And then when my wife saw my pee, my pee was like Coca-Cola, so dark. My wife said, something's wrong with you. You know, pee should be yellowish or, you know, but this is red, almost like Coke. So they rushed me to the hospital. My uncle at that time was the director of the hospital, Philippine Chinese General Hospital. When he admitted me in, he told my mother, he called my mom. He said, he cannot leave the hospital anymore. I cannot leave. Serious. My liver is affected already. Now, look at me. Here I am in the hospital room, lying down. I have to stay there at least for a week. You know, dextrose. You know, if you can only look up, what enters your mind? Imagine a hospital. Look up, what enters your mind? You know, when you look up, what enters your mind? What do you see when you look up? Tell me. No, you cannot see the sky. There's ceiling. I mean, ceiling, Mona, ceiling. You see ceiling. And then after the ceiling, you, you now imagine, okay? Okay, you, you now imagine the sky. And then when you imagine the sky, you think of God. In that hospital room, I knew God was talking to me. You know what God asked me? Peter, what will you do with your life? You see, I was teaching Bible. But God wanted me to start a church. I don't want to start a church. You know why I don't want to start a church? Let me tell you why. If you have a Bible study and you don't like the people, you just say goodbye. But if you start a church and you don't like the people, how do you say goodbye? <laughs> My wife told me, the day we start a church, you cannot stop. There will be people. Just look at you. We keep seeing each other. Yes or no? Because in a church, it's a family. It's a community. You have to love the community. And I said, Lord, whatever you want. Okay. If you want me to start. See, I knew. He wanted me to start CCF. And that's how CCF got started 35 years ago. It's called the invisible grace of God in the midst of problem. Now, some of you are angry at God today because you don't like what's happening to you. Perhaps you're having financial problem, relationship problem, and you're angry. May I suggest, instead of getting angry, is it possible? God is trying to talk to you. God is trying to tell you something. Can I tell you, after the first service, a lady came to me because she was swindled by her staff. 10 million pesos. I said, so what is God teaching you? I got a shock of my life. She said, God is telling me I must tight 
because I did not give my tithe. So they stole my money. I said, hallelujah. Because I was going to teach her how to run business. I was going to teach her. I said, you know what? Let me teach you. Make sure you have an auditor. Make sure you have a good accountant. But then when she told me, God spoke to her. Do you notice something when you're in trouble, God speaks to you? So whatever God is talking to you now, whatever that is, all right, that's grace telling you, wake up. Anyway, the amazing thing, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing nearby, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I look up to him. And Ananias said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his voice. Now, before I continue, God used Ananias to talk to Paul. If you study Acts chapter 9, you will notice something about Ananias. Ananias refused to talk to Paul. Ananias said, Lord, why will I go to talk to this man? He's going to put me in jail. And God told Ananias, no, you talk to him. He's my chosen instrument. You know, many times, God will use people to deliver a message. It's called the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Many times, God will speak to others through you. You know, God could have used a monkey. Do you know that? It would be more dramatic. God could use a donkey. Or God could use an angel. Of course, God can do it. But God did not use an angel. God used a person by the name of Ananias. And I praise God. Many of you, some of you can say, I can never be like Paul. But you can be like Ananias. Faithful. Prompting. If God is prompting you to talk to somebody, you better learn to listen. Last night, on my way from Davao to Manila, God prompted me to talk to somebody. You know why? Because I don't want to talk to anybody. I was tired. I wanted to prepare for my message. I was so happy. There was this guy seated beside me. He was an American from Davao City. And the Lord told me, you talk to him. I said, no, Lord, no, Lord. I want to study. I want to rest. I am tired. The Lord said, no, you talk to him about me. Lord, one exception, not tonight. I need to prepare tomorrow. So I need to prepare today. The Lord said, no, talk to him. I talked. And when I asked him a question, one to ten, well, you know, soft talk, then we went to Christianity. I said, one to ten, are you sure you'll go to heaven? One to ten. He answered, eight. Ah, I said, you are not sure. Two more points. You see, I discovered he was surrounded by Christians. He married a girl who is a Filipina who is a Christian. And her brother is a pastor. And his own sister, his own brother is a pastor. I said, you are surrounded by Christians. Why are you not committing your life to Jesus? You see? In time. You know, God is amazing. He uses simple people. It's good I opened up my mouth. And he began to be talking and talking and talking. And so the whole flight, the whole flight, we talk about the second coming. I showed him my PowerPoint about Jerusalem, Israel. In other words, God used that occasion because God loves him. You know what he promised us? After we got out of the airport, Pastor JP was with me and asked Pastor JP, JP, can you give him a lift? Because he was going to fly to Milwaukee. By the way, I was upgraded to business class, okay? Upgraded, free business class for one reason, to talk to this guy, okay? You know, God is amazing. And then that guy told JP, when CCF, we are going to put up a new church building in Davao, in Lanang. And the guy said, 
Once that is built, it's right in my neighborhood. I'll go to your church. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. My friend, the grace of God comes in many forms. Sometimes you don't like it. But remember, it's unmerited. It's uncoerced. It's from God. He loves you. And many times you don't appreciate it. But it's transformative. It will change you. Paul was changed. And you must receive it. You know why? Look. What is God's will for Paul? Let's read this together. The God of our fathers appointed you, number one, to know his will. The grace of God will let you know his will. To see the righteous one. You will see him. You will meet Jesus and to hear him. And the Bible tells us you will be a witness for him. That's God's will for us. Be a witness. You want to know God's will for your life? Relationship with God. Once you have a relationship with him, you will talk about him. You know, let me tell you the story of this guy. This guy is a lawyer. That's his wife. We were together in that amazing island called, I cannot even pronounce it, Vanuatu. This guy told me a story. His great-grandfather was a pastor, grandfather pastor. His father was committed Christian. But he was supposed to be a committed Christian. But he rebelled because his father was so strict. No drinking, no smoking, no movies. I mean, that's his background. Very, very strict, legalistic. So when I went to college, he said, I began drinking. And I told the Lord, okay? God wanted him to do something. He said, Lord, no. I will not do what you want me to do. He was in rebellion. Can I tell you something? I said, what happened to you? The grace of God. I said, what do you mean the grace of God? He said, one day, I was with my fraternity brothers. We were drunk. And we borrowed the boat of my father. Apparently, the father owns a speedboat. Now, you have to know in the speedboat, at the back, you have the outboard motor. The outboard motor can tilt, you know, it can move to go to shallow water. He said, my friend turned on the throttle full blast and pressed something that is not supposed to be pressed. So the boat flipped, okay, jump up. I said, what happened to you? I flew out of the boat. And when I landed, I landed on the propeller. Full speed. And he said, man, I, basically he's dead. Because when he landed on the water, you see, the grace of God, invisible, God spoke to him. And he immediately knew, God, if you save me, if I can swim to the boat, I will do what you want me to do. He could only swim with one hand. Pilai Nai. He showed me his scar. Awful scar. Very long. From the lungs all the way. But you know what? He said three miracles happened. Miracle number one. A paramedic from another boat saw what happened. He came and carried me to his boat. Full of blood. The paramedic was a fireman. But he was boating. Second miracle. When we landed on shore, there was a doctor. How can that be? There was a doctor. And the doctor had a cell phone. The cell phone was like a big box, okay? During those days, the cell phone is like a, you know, it's like a canteen, okay? big box. He said, who will ever see a doctor on a duck? And third miracle, the helicopter came. Brought him to the hospital. The third miracle was in the hospital. His family doctor was there. This family doctor just came from Europe attending a seminar about AIDS. A-I-D, AIDS, virus. And the doctor discovered a lot of blood in America are contaminated with AIDS virus. At that time, they don't screen against AIDS. And the doctor was there. And the doctor told the nurses, don't give him blood. No blood transfusion. I will call his father, I'll call his mother. So his parents came and they donated blood to him. And he said, that was the miracle. I'm alive today, serving the Lord. Is God amazing? 
Look at me. The grace of God. I'm deserving. I'm coerced. But you must respond. Have you responded to the grace of God? You know, the Apostle Paul responded. It's not easy. How do you respond? You'll be a witness. Now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You got to respond. The way Paul responded, he accepted Jesus, he got baptized. Now, don't misinterpret this verse. This verse does not mean when you're baptized, your sins are washed away. No. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. The washing of sins is connected with calling Jesus, not baptism. But baptism is a sign that you're believing in Jesus. What's my proof? Look at what Paul said, Acts 16. Somebody asked Paul, everybody read, what must I do to be saved? Answer, together. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Call on the name of Jesus. What about baptism? Baptism is later. After verse 32, the Bible tells us, and immediately he was baptized. So the sequence, believe and baptize. Why is that important? Because grace must be accepted. You must respond to grace by faith. And the act of baptism is a symbol of your faith. It is not baptism that will save you. It is faith that will save you. But you show your faith when you call on Jesus. So faith has to be received. <laughs> the Bible tells us it happened after Christ. When I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple. I fell into a trance and I saw Jesus saying to me, Make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. You know, the Apostle Paul had a hard life. You know, the grace of God does not mean life is easy. It can be tough. Paul had a tough life. But he loved the Lord. He was ready. And the Bible tells us his testimony. Lord, they themselves understand in every synagogue I used to imprison and beat those people up. And then Paul said, when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was standing by approving, watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And then Paul said, the Lord said, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. You see, the Apostle Paul encountered the grace of God. It's unmerited. God initiated it, uncoerced. It transformed his life. And the Bible tells us he accepted the challenge. And Paul is now a preacher all over the world. Gentiles. My friend, have you responded to the grace of God? You will not respond to the grace of God if you don't really understand grace. Let me help you understand grace. As we close, two words, four words you must know to know grace. The first word, repeat after me, justice. Next, revenge. Next, mercy. Next, grace. Let me explain to you. Justice, let's start with revenge. There was a man who was a pastor in Korea, true story. When there was a civil war between North and South Korea, the communists captured him, and the communists told him, renounce your faith, or we will shoot you. I will not renounce my faith. Okay. We will get your son. So they got his son. Put the son in front of him and his wife. Renounce your faith or we shoot your son. Now, if you are the father, what will you do? Be honest with me. You are the father. Renounce your faith or I'll shoot your son. You know the son, look at the father. Daddy, don't renounce Jesus. The wife, look at the father. Don't renounce Jesus. Boom! They killed the son. After the civil war, the soldier who killed the son was captured. 
he was court martial. Now, if you're the father, what is revenge? Revenge is once you see the soldier, you shoot the soldier. Take justice into your own hand. Yes? That's called vengeance. What is justice? Justice is you wait for the court martial to be finished. That's justice. What is you him? What is mercy? Mercy is I do not want him to be killed. Please forgive him. Mercy is withholding what is due. What is grace? Now, this is a true story. This pastor, his name is Pastor Kim. He went to see the general. He said, General, I know this boy killed my son. I ask for his forgiveness, and I will adapt him. I will adapt him. Grace. The boy was shocked. The boy said, the boy really was shocked. He couldn't believe it. The father said, young man, I talked to the general. You deserve to die. Justice. But I'm asking for mercy. That you don't die. But more than that, I want to adopt you. The boy got shocked. The father said, I have only one son. You killed my son. I don't have any more son. I want you to be my son. I will raise you up to be my son. That young boy became one of the most effective pastors in Korea. You know why? Because that boy experienced not only forgiveness. He experienced not only mercy. He experienced what? Grace. My friend, if you know the grace of God, it's undeserved. Your life will never be the same. Do you now understand why I do what I'm doing? I do what I'm doing because I'm a recipient of grace. What about you? Have you experienced God's grace? Let's bow our heads. If God has spoken to you and you want to experience God's grace, you have never been sure of your salvation. You know why? Because you don't understand grace. Now that you understand grace, it's because of Jesus. And you want to be sure of your salvation. You want to experience grace today. Raise your hands. I'll pray for you. Praise God. Anybody else? In other words, today, you finally understood grace. You finally understood. Grace means receiving unmerited favor. And God's favor is forgiveness. He wants to save you. He wants to make you his child. Not just forgive you, to make you his child. And you want to say yes to him. Raise your hands. Higher. Praise God. Higher. I want to pray for all of these people who are raising your hands. You want to experience the grace of God. Lord Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I need grace. I need forgiveness. But above all, I want to experience, I want to humble myself. I receive you, Jesus. I receive the grace of forgiveness, the grace of being your son. Father God, I accept Jesus today. Lord Jesus, I receive your grace. I receive your gift of eternal life. I receive your gift of making me your child. I now understand it's about your grace, not about my righteousness. It's about your faithfulness, your loving kindness for me. I receive it, Lord Jesus. Those of you who raise your hands up, I want to pray for you now. I want to pray for you, okay? Stand up. Stand up. Between you and Jesus, I want to pray for you now. Today is your day of experiencing God's grace. You humble yourselves, and I want to pray for you. You know, God's grace... To be received, you need to be humble. So if God is speaking to you, you be humble. Stand up. Don't be too proud and not to stand up. Anybody else? Praise God. I know in a time like this, you are struggling. Should I humble myself? What if people will see me? 
Don't care about what people will see you or not. It's between you and the Lord. You say, Lord, here I am. I humble myself. Anybody else? Praise God. Lord Jesus, I pray for this group of men and women. Help them understand grace. Grace is undeserved. Let them realize we become your child by grace, not because we deserve it. Lord Jesus, I thank you for showing me grace by choosing me, by choosing them. Lord, they are not here today by accident. So will you help all of these people who have stood up to really experience your grace, the assurance of forgiveness because of your grace? Give them peace. Give them joy. Give them a new life, a transformed life because of grace. Change their heart. Change their desire. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody.